Shall we start recording, please? Good afternoon and welcome to today's New York City Council hearing of the Committee on Mental Health, Disabilities and Addiction. At this time, will all panelists please turn on their videos. Thank you. To minimize disruption, please place electronic devices on vibrate or silent mode. If you wish to submit testimony, you may do so at testimony at council.nyc.gov. Again, that is testimony at council.nyc.gov. Thank you for your cooperation and we are ready to begin. Good afternoon, everyone. We're calling this meeting to order. Good afternoon, everyone. I am Council Member Diana Ayala, Chair of the Committee on Mental Health, Disabilities and Addiction. And I'd like to thank everyone for joining us today for this remote hearing. This afternoon, we are holding an oversight hearing to examine increased drug overdose, depression, and anxiety during COVID-19, and to hear legislation, intro 2005, sponsored by Council Member Lewis, which is a local law in relation to reporting on mental health and, um, of New Yorkers during the COVID-19 public health crisis. COVID-19 has brought emotional anxiety and social economic uncertainties. The fear of contracting coronavirus, a deadly disease that has killed hundreds of thousands of people has been compounded by the ripple effects of the pandemic on, a daily basis, uh, on daily life. For many, these concerns include exposure to infected sources, worry about infected family members, the loss of loved ones, school closures, and the pressures of homeschooling children, the loss of childcare, job loss, economic insecurity, home confinement issues, ranging from social and emotional isolation to domestic violence concerns, the inability to effectively manage pre-existing physical or psychological conditions, inadequate access to supplies such as groceries and money for rent and utilities, loss of employer-sponsored healthcare resulting in lack of prescription medication and an overall shortage of pandemic-related um, resources such as timely testing and access to personal protective equipment. Prior to COVID-19, nearly one in five American adults reported having a mental illness, serious mental illness, or major depre depressive episode within the past year. For many, the COVID-19 pandemic has served as to exacerbate pre-existing medical, um, mental health, and substance use disorders. And according to a July 2020 Kaiser Family Foundation tracking poll, 53% of adults in the United States reported that their mental health had been negatively impacted due to worry and stress over COVID-19, which is a significantly higher number than the 32% previously reported in March of this year. Notably, barriers to accessing mental health and substance use disorder services during the pandemic compounded behavioral health problems, and a recent study found that 13.3% of adults found new or increased substance use to be an effective coping tool for increased stress and anxiety. In July, respondents to a Siena College poll reported that 59% of New Yorkers have been affected by or touched by opioid abuse, up from 54% two years ago. According to preliminary New York City Police Department statistics, while overdoses have fallen overall in the first half of 2020, overdose deaths appear to have significantly increased during this time. However, the OHMH has stated that it is currently too soon to tell if there has been a spike in overdose deaths due to the way that the data is tracked using anecdotal evidence rather than real-time statistics. According to some preliminary statistics, Queens saw a 56% spike in overdose deaths during the first five months of the year. 
Staten Island saw 58 overdose fatalities so far this year, representing an increase from 49 at the same time last year. Additionally, emer emergency medical technicians in New York City administered opioid overdose reversal narcotics 23% more often than last year. At today's hearing, the committee looks forward to hearing from the administration and community advocates about the programs and initiatives that are being utilized to address rising mental health challenges and substance abuse disorder and overdose rates in New York and learning about what the council can do to continue to address the needs of New Yorkers throughout the COVID-19 pandemic. I wanna thank the representatives of the uh, administration who are here today from the OHMH and Thrive uh, for their commitment to ensuring quality mental health services are available to all New Yorkers. And I look forward to hearing from about what is being done to ensure that these services are delivered when and where they are needed and the role that the city council can play in supporting those efforts. I also wanna thank my colleagues as well as my committee staff, senior council staff list, legislative policy analyst, Chrissy Dwyer, finance analyst, Lauren Hunt, my deputy chief of staff, Michelle Cruz, and chief of staff, Jose Rodriguez for making this hearing possible. I will now turn this uh, hearing over to council member Lewis for a brief remarks. Good afternoon, everyone, and good afternoon, Chair Ayala and members of the Committee on Mental Health. I want to thank you for the opportunity to discuss Intro 2005 today, a key piece of legislation that I introduced earlier this year. As we all are intimately aware, the impact of COVID-19 pandemic on the thousands who contracted the illness and overall well-being of our community was unthinkable. The realities of the pandemic have put an insurmountable amount of pressure on New Yorkers who are forced to navigate a world that is riddled with anxiety. I represent one of the hardest hit communities where families were devastated by the widespread loss of life, struggled with social isolation due to stay at home orders and grew increasingly concerned for their personal safety. As schools and small businesses were forced to close, thousands of New Yorkers became suddenly unemployed, frontline and essential workers became overwhelmed, and uncertainty surrounding the virus itself has created an environment which is incredibly detrimental to the mental health of our constituents of all ages. My bill, intro 2005, which requ would require the Department of Health, Health and Mental Health to generate a report on the mental health of New Yorkers during COVID-19 public health crisis that will provide us with insightful information to revolutionize how the city responds and offers support to the most vulnerable populations based upon data. The COVID-19 pandemic has shown us that none of us are immune to the dilapidating effects of mental illness. Even the most well-adjusted person can feel isolated, hopeless, and alone. It is critical that we make a concerted effort to track and report on these issues before it's too late. I have prioritized this bill because earlier this summer, I had some constituents and heard of incidents and even had a childhood friend, Marquise Anindo, who died to these very circumstances. He took his own life because his mental health needs were unmet. As we come to terms with our new normal, we recognize that this tragic situation is not unique. Intro 2005 will ensure that we identify, track, and log these needs while paving the way for future relief. The trauma caused by COVID-19 will not be healed overnight, and it may take us several years before we can fully recover. During this period, we must consider the mental health of and well-being, physical well-being of all New Yorkers. I want to thank you, Chair Ayala, for holding this hearing today as I look forward to today's testimonies and public discourse on mental health in New York City. Thank you, Chairwoman. Thank you, Councilmember Lewis, and I'm sorry to hear about your friend. Um, my condolences uh, to you and his family. Um, and in addition to Councilmember Lewis, I want to welcome uh, council members, Ampri Samuels and Borelli, who are also members of the committee and who are present here today. I am not sure who's testifying first, um, so it may be. Thank you, Chair Ayala. Thank you. 
I'm gonna now go over a couple of procedural items. My name is Sara Liss and I am counsel to the Committee on Mental Health Disabilities and Addiction for the New York City Council. I will be moderating today's hearing. Before we begin, I wanted to remind everyone that I would be calling on panelists to testify. Everyone will be on mute until you're called on to testify, at which point the host will unmute you. Uh, I also want to remind everyone that there may be a few seconds of delay for you to become unmuted and we appreciate your patience in advance. Please listen for your name for, to be called. I'll be periodically announcing the next panelist. At today's hearing, the first panel will be the administration followed by council member questions and then the public will testify. During the hearing, if council members would like to ask questions, please use the Zoom raise hand function and I will call on you in order. I will now call the first panel members of the administration to testify, which will include Dr. Hillary Cunnins, Executive De Deputy Commissioner of Mental Hygiene for the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene, Scott Bloom, Director of School Mental Health Services, Office of School Mental Health, Department of Health and Mental Hygiene, Department of Education, and Susan Herman, Director of Thrive NYC. I will administer the oath to the administration and this will include both those who are testifying and those who will be answering council member questions. When you hear your name, please respond. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? Dr. Cunnins. I do. Thank you. Director Bloom. I do. Thank you. And Director Herman. I do. Thank you very much. And as soon as you're ready, you can begin testifying. Thanks. Thanks. Um, uh, good afternoon, uh, Chair Ayala, Council Member Lewis, members of the committee. Um, my first virtual hearing, uh, getting used to the muting and unmuting. I am Dr. Hillary Cunnins, Executive Deputy Commissioner of the Division of Mental Hygiene at the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene. And as you know, I am joined today by Director Susan Herman from the Mayor's Office of Thrive NYC and Scott Bloom, Director of Mental Health in the Office of School Health. On behalf of Commissioner Chokshi, thank you for the opportunity to testify today about the behavioral health challenges related to the COVID-19 public health emergency in New York City. As you have already described, uh, New Yorkers are facing unprecedented difficulties during this time. These difficulties are myriad and include illness and loss of life and loved ones, as we just poignantly heard from the council member physical distancing, disruption of social connections, job loss, and financial insecurity, and uncertainty as we transition through phases of reopening. It is normal during this difficult time and even expected to feel overwhelmed, sad, anxious, and afraid. Unfortunately, Black, Latinx, and Asian New Yorkers have experienced disproportionate health and social burdens from the pandemic. Like so many other health disparities, the consequences of COVID-19 are driven by underlying health as well as other inequities caused by structural racism. The health department has made it a priority to mitigate, <clears throat> mitigate the pandemic's repercussions on our hardest hit communities. I also wanna mention that we anticipate that the behavioral health consequences of COVID-19 are likely to outlast the pandemic itself. Similar to past disasters, some of those consequences emerge both immediately and in the longer term. The health department is taking action to support both immediate and longer term behavioral health needs and particularly, as I mentioned, focusing on the communities as well as the providers most burdened. First, I'd like to tell you about what we do know about how the, the pandemic is affecting the behavioral health and well-being of New Yorkers. Um, 
according to our health department opinion poll just recently released that includes a survey of 1200 New Yorkers age 18 and older, healthcare workers, adults with children in the household, adults afraid of interpersonal violence, and adults who have a family member with a chronic health condition are more likely to report adverse mental health as a result of the COVID pandemic than other New Yorkers. Our poll also shows that COVID-19 is having an impact on anxiety and depression among adult New Yorkers. 44% of the people we surveyed reported symptoms of anxiety due to COVID-19, and more than a third, 36%, reported symptoms of depression in the prior two weeks. Finally, 35% of adults with children in their household report that the emotional or behavioral health of at least one of their children has been negatively affected by the pandemic. The reasons for adverse mental health also vary across race and ethnicity. So for example, Latinx and Asian adults were more likely than white adults to report a job loss or reduced hours of employment. These are factors that lead, can lead to or be associated with worse mental health symptoms or outcomes. Latinx adults in New York City were more likely than white adults to report feelings of financial stress similarly a risk factor for adverse mental health outcomes. During the pandemic, New Yorkers have had more contacts with NYC Well, which as you know, is the city's free and confidential behavioral health support and referral service supported by Thrive NYC. Contacts have increased since mid-March of this year compared to the 2019 average. Additionally, as you know, and as Council Member Ayala pointed out, New York City is still facing an opioid overdose epidemic. Although uh, we, uh, we do not know fully the impact of COVID-19 on overdose, we do know of the many challenges the pandemic has posed for people with opioid use disorder. Importantly, their need to stay connected to treatment and other services and know that disruptions in treatment can increase risk of overdose. In response to these very serious um, statistics and information, the health department along with other city agencies have employed a number of strategies to support New Yorkers during this challenging time. First, we work directly with our contracted behavioral health and other service providers to help uh, and help them transition to telehealth and virtual platforms to maintain access to care for New Yorkers. We help these providers identify new ways to deliver services, keep clients engaged, while at the same time adhering to the very important physical distancing guidelines. Through frequent outreach and communication with this provider community, we connected them with additional information and resources to support their ongoing operations. We also funded a platform to address staffing needs for behavioral health providers during the peak of the pandemic in New York City. We also developed and disseminated guidance for all behavioral health service providers, delivering virtual trainings on a wide range of topics, including how congregate care providers can adhere to physical distancing in their settings and also to participate and support contact tracing. We provided information and training on financial stability, sustainability, support to manage staff burnout, grief and loss, and to reduce substance use related harms created or exacerbated by the pandemic. We made particular effort to engage and support providers who work with groups disproportionately affected by COVID, including syringe service programs, opioid overdose prevention programs, providers who serve elderly adults with mental health needs, and providers who work with immigrant communities, to name a few. We will continue to work closely with these and other behavioral health providers. In addition to supporting our provider community, we directly serve New Yorkers. We adapted several of our existing initiatives to meet the demands uh, and challenges of this moment. We launched some new behavioral health services and partnered with other city agencies to implement new or adapted programs. And again, these initiatives really center communities disproportionately burdened by COVID 
as well as other health disparities. I'll now highlight some of these new and or adapted initiatives. First, we took swift action to help New Yorkers identify, understand, and manage their responses to COVID-19. We released guidance and public messaging around experiences of stress, anxiety, and grief, resilience, and emotional well-being, and offered tools to cope with mental health challenges and to manage uh, substance use. To date, we have released 24 guidance documents, which are available in 26 languages to directly support New Yorkers. We released uh, several social media and media campaigns uh, to encourage New York to call, text, or chat with NYC Well to obtain free and confidential support or referrals to services. And I'll also mention, though not written in my formal testimony, we are going to be releasing a suicide prevention campaign, which will start airing next week. We also worked to maintain continuity of life-saving services and treatments for New Yorkers who use drugs or have an opioid use disorder. We launched a new program, our methadone delivery system, which reduces the need for visits to methadone clinics and makes medication available to patients who are in isolation or quarantine. We have made more than 1300 deliveries since the program's launch in late April. This program was made possible because of emergency regulations issued by the state and federal government and hopefully will be made permanent. We also have made naloxone, which as you know, a medication that can reverse an opioid overdose and can be administered by lay people. We have made naloxone available for free at 15 pharmacies in neighborhoods with a high burden of fatal overdose in all isolation hotels and worked with congregate care providers to make that available in their settings. The health department is partnering now with the Department of Homeless Ser Services to amplify outreach in neighborhoods where homelessness and public substance use are of concern. We are conducting outreach and engagement in collaborative teams to engage community members, uh, offer engagement and referral to services and to provide naloxone as well as other needed items like sexual health kits. We are working with the Mayor's Office of Immigrant Affairs to provide communities with immigrants with access to mental health resources that meet their needs. We have also worked with New York City Health and Hospitals as well as their partners to create a resilience and trauma training series to, to support healthcare workers and first responders. In addition to these efforts, we have recently started up a new community education program in New York City's most impacted neighborhoods. This program provides a virtual presentation to address COVID-19's impact on mental health, health disparities, and the impact of trauma, grief, and anxiety. The program offers information about effective coping skills and mental health resources available in New York City to those most affected by the COVID pandemic. Between uh, July, uh, when the program launched, and August, our initiative partnered with community groups to engage more than 1,300 New Yorkers, and we strive to reach 10,000 New Yorkers by the end of 2020. These are just a few of our highlights of our efforts to support New Yorkers over the last six months. And has, this work has been built on the meaningful progress we have made over the last several years to increase access to mental health and substance use services through the administration's initiatives, including Thrive NYC, the Crisis Prevention and Response Task Force, and Healing NYC. We will continue to monitor uh, our behavioral health data, continue to work with providers and listen to communities to design and enhance services to help New Yorkers through this pandemic. Now I'd like to turn to the legislation being heard today. Intro 2000, 2005 would require the health department to report aggregate counts of mental health diagnoses and case data from across the behavioral health care system that have occurred since COVID-19 was declared a public health emergency. The health department, as you have heard, uses population level data and surveys to identify health trends across the city. 
We rely on a variety of data sources to track trends in behavioral health, including citywide health surveys, like the community health survey, emergency department data, data from our own health department programs, and regular feedback from providers and community partners. Several of our data so sources also capture demographic information so we can evaluate differences across uh, race and ethnicity, age, gender, and geography. We have shared today some provisional findings for 2020 and additional population level monitoring is ongoing. However, the types of data requested in this bill, individual level case and service data are not reported to the health department, nor is this data accessible in an organized fashion. Although health and behavioral healthcare providers keep patient records, which are only for people that seek, who seek care and have received a diagnosis, providers do not submit this information to a centralized entity, nor do they have the capacity. Nonetheless, the health department remains committed to using data to address and respond to the behavioral health needs of New Yorkers. And we are happy to discuss with council how we can best support the intent of this legislation. We rely on the feedback of our partners in the city council and members of the community like those here to testify today. I wanna to thank you very much for your continued partnership, feedback and support as we continue to care for the health of New Yorkers during this critical time in the city's history. I am happy to take your questions. Thank you very much. We now turn to Chair Ayala to begin questions. Thank you, Hillary. Um, I, I mean, I have, I, I, I think I'm, I have so much, I have so many questions only because I, I, I understand the severity of, of this pandemic and the impact that it's had on the city and in, in the way that we uh, typically provide services in the way that people know us to provide services. And so um, first I want to commend, you know, you, because I know that you got, that the, the Department of Health has been working really, um, really hard um, around this pandemic. And, and I want to acknowledge that. Um, I have a lot of questions regarding um, the, a significant uptick in, in drug use and what, what I'm hearing um, and interpreting as a lack of access to services during the pandemic. Um, in, in my district, which was one of the highest hit by, uh, by, by uh, COVID, I uh, had some of the highest rates of infection, um, have some of the highest uh, saturation of public housing developments where a lot of uh, the infections were occurring. I've also seen um, a significant uptake in public drug use. Um, and we've heard countless uh, stories from constituents and individuals on the street about um, the lack of access to uh, programs, to staff, because everyone is working remotely. Um, some people not having telephones and not being able to access someone, you know, immediately. Um, some things seem to work really well and just some things seem to have kind of um, not worked as well. And, um, and I can't help but, but notice uh, that even in my, in my community, um, I'm dealing with a very serious um, drug addiction um, epidemic within this pandemic. Um, which is very challenging um, because it's a community that's facing a lot of challenges. We have the highest rates of uh, domestic violence, of gun violence. Um, you know, we were the hardest hit during this pandemic. And now um, we are also faced with a serious um, heroin uh, use uh, issue, which has, which seems to be growing um, by the day. And I wanted kind of to get um, your observations on what exactly you know you feel that we did well and where there were areas that we could have done better that may explain why you know um, some communities including mine are seeing such a significant increase in the number of, uh, of individuals that are publicly using um, and just wanted to really just kind of get a sense from 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 you 
um, if you know, what, what do you, what are those things that you think worked well and, and what, where do you think that we could have done better? Um, thank, thank you, Councilman Briella. Um, and as you know, that this is an issue that is, um, extremely concerning to us uh, at the health department, for us as a city, for us as a country. Um, we um, don't yet have indication, I, I wanna just clarify for you about what our understanding is that drug use itself has increased. Uh, we, uh, we do do uh, community surveys which uh, um, will provide the information and don't have that yet. Similarly, um, uh, despite some of the reports that you just mentioned from, from other colleagues, we don't have uh, finalized overdose data uh, yet in some, in, but, but will have soon. What I do think you are sharing is the sense that public drug use has increased. Um, one of the challenges uh, to this pandemic is that places where people might have gone are less accessible. They are less accessible because of physical distancing guidelines. And so while uh, services can happen remotely, spaces to be, to uh, uh, get a cup of coffee or so forth, may have been reduced because of, of pandemic precautions. When you ask how we could have done that better, I think this is one of the things that we're all learning and we're, we're actively working with some of the spaces uh, that have services for people who use drugs to support them to reopen as safely as possible. Uh, so the spaces are small uh, and sometimes difficult to stay to balance the, the infectious disease risks with the uh, need to deliver services in a closed space. Uh, so that has been a balancing act. Um, we are working uh, as, as services return to in-person in communities to do that uh, safely and, and efficiently to address the issues that you're describing, council member. And, I will say we at the health department working very closely with Department of Homeless Services have um, street outreach teams in place um, uh, uh, across different neighborhoods where we've heard concern to provide people resources and referrals uh, every day of the week. I think you had one more question embedded in what you just said. Um, I don't remember, but do you so when do we when do we anticipate that these programs will become um, uh, available to the public again? So, so some so uh, some are are already right now available um, and are as reopening happens, considering at every step how how much more available, meaning they have spaces where maybe, um, in one phase, it was 25% occupancy, in the next phase, 50%. And so as, as opening happens, they can accommodate more people safely. I can share with you that the majority right now of the syringe service programs are accepting um, participants on site in a variety of fashions, uh, fashion, but that occupancy will, um, will loosen as reopening loosens. Oh, uh, I mean, it's this the syringe program. So as we are reopening the syringe program, um, you know, it brings to light again. And I'm sorry that I, I, I use my my district because again, it's always you know it's it's one of the the highest uh, needs uh, districts. But so we, for instance, we have uh, in East Harlem alone, we have one group that does a uh, syringe litter uh, pickup. In the midst of the pandemic, with all of the programs being closed, we're seeing a lot again of uh, very active drug use, um, but not uh, not enough uh, syringe litter uh, cleanup. Is that a service that was also put on pause that will resume anytime soon, or is that is, is just just you know that we don't have enough resources to go around? Um. So I'm. Um... So that service uh, was not necessarily paused. As you know, the syringe service programs um, are involved with syringe 
uh, pickup, um, as you know, from our work in East Harlem and, both, and in the South Bronx. And it also involves our colleagues at Department of Sanitation. And we will definitely bring that, that concern back uh, and, and address it. Yeah, I just, I really do feel that there is a lot more work that needs to be done um, in that area. Uh, I, you know, I'm literally sitting across the street from, you know, uh, an encampment that is not, you know, is made up of, of individuals that are not necessarily homeless, um, but that the homelessness has kind of become secondary to um, their uh, drug addiction. And so, you know, so I have children that are literally walking down the street and are witness to individuals self-injecting in public. And I, you know, I'm, I, I feel, and I'm sure that my colleagues, you know, um, some of my colleagues can attest to, you know, I feel desperate and I feel very, uh, you know, sometimes very much abandoned by the city in this respect, because I haven't heard from anyone. I haven't, you know, and, and I'm sure that there's some data that gives us, um, you know, a, a synopsis of those communities that are the highest hit where those resources should really, you know, be um, funneled in abundance, right? And it, it almost appeared like, and I, and I get it because I was also, you know, at home quarantine like everyone else. And when I came out of quarantine, I was very, uh, very much thrown aback by just the conditions out on the street um, and how, how desperate they are. And so, so, you know, I know that, you know, there's a lot of work that needs to be done. Um, I know that th there was an effort to provide a lock zone at, at different pharmacies throughout the city. I believe there were 15. Can you tell us a little bit how, uh, what the selection process was? How did you identify those 15 and, and what the marketing um, around the accessibility of those, uh, those resources was? Absolutely. Um, uh, so, as you know, we have that the department has been uh, aggressively distributing naloxone to community organizations over the last many years. And under Healing NYC, we increased distribution uh, to, to significantly more than 100,000 kits annually. And of course, with the pandemic, uh, with uh, pausing uh, in person group trainings because of risk of infectious disease, we, we looked for alternate distribution. So I do, I'll, one of the strategies was to partner with 15 uh, uh, chain pharmacies in neighborhoods with the highest rates of overdose and basically give them city naloxone kits to be able to distribute for free to clients. Um, we sent out that message to our partner organizations, especially the syringe service programs, outreach programs to get that message out and to get kits out the door that way. We also, however, and importantly worked with our overdose, all of our registered um, opioid overdose prevention programs to convert to virtual trainings and to be able to mail kits out and not require that people come to an in-person pickup point to, in order to obtain a kit. So we transitioned to mail that way. We also worked with all of our uh, isolation hotel partners and the agencies running the isolation hotels to make naloxone kits available through that mechanism. Uh, so though the pharmacies were one part of the strategy, they were not the entire strategy. Was the use of was the prescription of uh, methadone and um, and buprenorphine also uh, something that that was mailed to clients? So one, we can't mail methadone or buprenorphine because they are controlled substances. So you they need to be um, picked up um, uh, in person. However, um, important changes got made there as well. Methadone was um, we, the city health department together with our colleagues at the state uh, started up a home delivery program, meaning if somebody was receiving methadone treatment and was home either in isolation or quarantine or, or themselves at high risk for complications of COVID, we uh, were able to deliver methadone to them in their home so that they themselves did not put themselves at risk for infection uh, or somebody that they uh, cared for. 
or if they were isolating because of their own infection. So that was a strategy to uh, minimize both exposure and infection. In terms of buprenorphine, similar regulations at the state and federal level enabled the city buprenorphine providers to start buprenorphine virtually, meaning you didn't have to come in for an evaluation to an office, but you could receive that care telephonically or by video. Um, and as an example, the uh, health and hospitals started up a virtual buprenorphine clinic as did many of the buprenorphine primary care sites that the health department funds so that people could get evaluate, get, get refills or get an initial prescription either telephonically or virtually. Uh, sometimes they would need to go to the pharmacy to pick up the prescription. Some pharmacies did do delivery. I know the virtual services seem to be very popular. Um, I, I just, I worry about those individuals that just don't, don't have a, a means of communicating, um, you know, because maybe they, they have no phone, no access to phone or um, the technology that they would need uh, to, co to communicate effectively. Um, do you know, is, can you tell us, if, is, is the city uh, currently uh, conducting active uh, street outreach to narcotics users, including um, offering services, clean syringes, sharp boxes, and medication distribution? since the pandemic began? Yes, although if I may, to go back to your first question, your telephone question, your yeah. virtual telephone question, then I'll jump to that. So um, I, I think for those of us who have been long time in the behavioral health field, who probably approach the work with a strong feeling that in-person is the best possible strategy, uh, have been, uh, uh, have had that idea uh, really challenged in a good way, which is that so many providers have been telling us that virtual care seems to be very effective at engaging people, clients, patients, participants, and that participants and patients really seem to, to like it that it is a way, it's an easy way to show up for a visit or an appointment. Our providers are reporting higher than expected uh, adherence rates showing up for appointments uh, and including with the care, which has its own challenges to children and families. Um, so this has been extraordinary. There have been several um, uh, strategies to help people who don't have access to telephones, um, uh, Medicaid is, is supporting reimbursement. Um, I will need to fact check myself here of minutes and phones. We at the city have been tried to be very flexible with contracted providers who wanted to provide access via minutes or telephones to, to their clients. So we um, know that um, some of the technology access can be challenging and, and have taken steps to resolve some of that. Um, and I think this is really beginning what I hope to be a new era in, in behavioral health services that is, can use a menu of approaches to care for people that include in-person care, telephonic care, video care, uh, with reimbursement that includes ability to access technology. And I think it will, I hope, leave us as behavior, the behavioral health sector uh, more flexible in how we think about and reach people. So I do want to- Is the reimbursement rate equal, um, equal to what you would receive for in-person? So for the moment it is, it is uh, under, a, at the state level, a temporary order. Um, but I think that we would uh, very much be in favor of preserving that flexibility and reimbursement and equivalency. Turning to your other, your second question, um, Chair Ayala, around outreach. So as I mentioned um, in my testimony, and I'll just amplify a bit more, uh, we, um, as you probably know, have a, 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 a small service called HEAT, Health Engagement and Assessment Teams, which are available um, to work with people pre and post crisis. 
connect in order to connect them with services. These are folks with behavioral health needs, whether mental health or substance use. Um, and also to work with communities to help refer to services. Uh, during the last uh, month, uh, in response to many community concerns uh, around public drug use, as you mentioned, Council, um, Council Member Ayala, um, we have uh, uh, worked very closely with Department of Homeless Services to conduct street outreach across the city in neighborhoods where we have understand there are concerns about public drug use or mental illness, to work with folks to engage them, establish trust, offer referral to care and services, reconnect people who may have lost access to care, who may have been once in care, um, and, and to also uh, provide services like naloxone uh, when people are interested. We are out in communities uh, seven days a week, uh, eight hours a day uh, across the city. So I'm going to ask one last question. I want to acknowledge that we've been joined by Council Member Van Bramer. I'll ask one last question, and then I want to try, um, uh, ensure that my colleagues have an opportunity to ask you questions as well. But um, what what do you consider to be your biggest challenge when trying to uh, to connect an individual with serious mental illness to service? Because oftentimes, and I and I and I have I, and I, the Heat team is actually uh, actively um, in my community now. I think that they're more active now than they were in the last few weeks because of also they, there were some restrictions there. Um, but again, we saw that when the uh, governor shut down the uh, train stations at night, um, there were a number of individuals who, again, um, you know, appeared uh, to just be homeless, but are in reality, many uh, suffer from chronic mental illness that has not been addressed. And it, it almost appeared that when the trains uh, shut down, they were forced to come above ground and there were no resources or services available to them. And um, oftentimes in my conversations with outreach workers, um, you know, there's a lot of back and forth about what exactly would classify an individual as being chronically mentally ill. Um, I have an individual that I encounter every single day who wears no shoes, no, no shirt, uh, is, probably not even aware of time and, and, and place. Um, and, uh, you know, he continues just to be out on the street. And, um, you know, one of the, uh, one of the things that I, I consistently hear about, you know, why he's not receiving services is because, you know, he's not a threat to anyone at the time that uh, individuals are encountering with him. But I find that, the, that leaving him out there without access to services is the equivalent of leaving a child who's not able to make decisions for themselves out on the street and that we're waiting for either this individual to, uh, you know, to, to pass away um, in the same street or to become so severely ill that now we, our first encounter with him is in the emergency room. And so I, I always struggle with that. And I wonder what is the biggest impediment um, that prevents us as a city from, you know, truly connecting those that need the services the most to, uh, to care, to adequate care. Unmute her, please. Zara, can you unmute her? Who has access? Okay, there you go. Sorry, I muted and then it, I couldn't unmute. Uh, sorry about that. Um, you know, I think you raise, uh, you know, one of the challenging uh, issues for not, not just us as a city, but what is, ha what is happening nationally, which is, um, which is the intersection of mental illness with, with housing needs and, and service needs. And I think the case that you describe without knowing all the details, it's hard to know, you know exactly what happened and when, but some of the parameters include if, if a mental health team assesses the person to have capacity that is knows, uh, what decisions they're making and understands the consequences, uh, mental, uh, mental health law would prevent um, that person from being hospitalized uh, against their will, even if it appears 
to you or to me that the person is is harming themselves. And so there are some legal protections, civil rights protections for people with serious mental illness. And I don't know for sure whether this is the case in this particular instance of this individual. Um, that said, there is um, so much that can be done and should be done. And the city had been working uh, before COVID across agencies, Home Department of Public Services with the health department to problem solve around situations such as you're describing uh, where somebody seems to be uh, in danger, where there's community concern um, in order to use every possible tool we can uh, both directly provided services from the city or as well as provider or contracted services. And so I'm happy to hear more about that person afterwards and, and bring them to our problem solving group to see if we could not address that. In general, uh, we are uh, at the city um, reinvigorating efforts, uh, which had uh, perhaps uh, been a bit uh, we're on pause during pause, but we are reinvigorating every effort to coordinate services to make sure we are deploying every tool that we have to address uh, the concerns that, that you're describing now. Tara No, I, I appreciate it. I think it's something that I hear about um, often and, and, you know, I think, you know, I would love to be able to work with with you um, to try to share some of what I'm seeing and you know um, see how we can how we can be helpful with the council because you know ultimately we have the same goal um, but something seems to have shifted and I I, I feel like uh, you know I, I understand you know that you know we couldn't control the, the governor you know the governor's choice to close uh, the train stations for cleaning at night um, but I think that there needed to be a better coordination of services to ensure that those people that were living in subway stations um, for years you know um, some of them were accessing um, services and I have I have a bunch of other questions and um, but I want to I want to give uh, my colleague very quickly an opportunity I think we still have to hear from um, a few people including my favorite Dr. Herman um, Zara do we have any uh, we can turn now to Councilmember Lewis to see if she has any questions on her legislation or anything else Thanks. Um, I'm working from another location, so I'm trying to figure all this out. So I'm sorry with all the moving around. I only have two quick questions. The first one, um, it was mentioned earlier, um, as we have in conversations about hardest hit communities, um, you shared earlier that your agency is partnering with Moya um, on different kinds of services. So I just wanted to know if you could share further what communities receive those services during COVID, how is it being tracked? Um, if you could just share some more information about how the services, how it's being tracked and how that information is gonna be reported. Uh, let, me, let me speak um, even more, more generally beyond, including the work with immigrant communities, um, but, but also about tracking generally. We, we do track where we deliver services, what neighborhoods are, are and, and who is receiving um, behavioral health services in the city. We track that um, very uh, granularly for some services and others we know are more citywide services like NYC Well. Um, so for any particular service, our goal is to deliver in places of highest need. So for example, the community presentations that I'm describing to you, we are gonna be tracking them at the neighborhood level and are interested in making sure we reach communities that are uh, highest hit. In other cases where we are funding particular organizations to then deliver the services, we know that their services have a particular catchment area and know 
um, which communities that they are generally working with. So for example, uh, we contract with an organization called Ham Hamilton Madison House, which provides um, people who are Asian with mental health treatment and case management and are multilingual. That organization serves uh, folks in the neighborhood where they are located as well as Asian speaking uh, New Yorkers from uh, nearby and, and other New York City neighborhoods. Um, and so that's one example. And we're happy to go into, I'm happy to go into more detail if you are interested. No, that's helpful. Thank you for that. Um, and what we'll have further conversations offline. I just wanted to hear briefly what that was looking like. My last question, um, and this was shared earlier, given the lack of accessibility to sites due to COVID, um, is there some type of plan to disaggregate the data to highlight the types of suicide um, that we've been that that's been reported, so that we can understand what the agencies need? Uh, to pull in what resources is needed. For example, we know when it comes to, to guns, it, um, we know we have to pull in NYPD, drugs, et, et cetera. But when there's a spike in COVID and the city, the city has to like do a hyper local response uh, to bring cases down, I wanted to know if the city would be willing to explore that model regarding suicide rates when it comes to different things being utilized. Thanks. Um, am I, yes, I'm unmuted. Um, yeah, I, I, well, let, let me share what we know, what we know about suicide from, from prior years and, and just kind of say that, um, New York, um, uh, sees particular patterns in methods of suicide that are generally um, away from firearms actually and towards other means. And so our prevention efforts, uh, both through individual community organizations um, uh, focus on um, in addition to gun safety, actually thinking about other strategies. A main suicide prevention method is, is as you can, imagine access to mental health services and not just providing access, but providing messages that uh, getting help is okay and normal and lots of people need help and trying to get messages like that through us directly from government, but through community partners as well. There are some key providers in the city who are expert in reaching younger people and specifically uh, some communities. I'll cite, for example, uh, a fantastic program called Life is Precious, I believe that has city council support that really provides tailored approaches to young people as well as their families and has been active throughout COVID. Um, and so sometimes, and we're New York City, I should also tell you historically has had much lower suicide rates than the rest of the country. Um, and so um, we will continue to track and monitor and we would be very open to talking, of course, about new approaches um, and thinking about how to best use current resources to do new approaches, including hyper-local ones. I appreciate um, um, you mentioning that. We um, uh, have been also very careful, just speaking about our hyper-local COVID response, to being sure that those responses include access to mental health support where needed for, for, for New Yorkers coming in for those services as well. Happy to hear that you're open to new approaches. So look forward to having uh, those conversations. That's all the questions I have, Chairwoman. Thank you. I want to acknowledge that we were also joined by Councilmember Cabrera. Um, I'm not sure if Councilmember Borelli has a question. I know he's on the phone. Uh, maybe we can get back to him. Okay. Um, so I think that we can um, we can continue. I think Susan Herman is next, I believe. Sorry. Yes, Director Herman is not delivering testimony, but she's available for questions. Happy to take questions. 
Perfect. Okay, I have questions, Hillary. I have, I have for all of the both of you. I have questions. <laughs> um, well, I'm not. I'm not sure. I would love to learn a little bit more about the uh, Well NYC um, calls because, according to the recent to recent reports and the mayor's management report, uh, New York City Well saw a 17% surge in calls during the height of the COVID-19 pandemic but still found that the hotline made 262,200 supportive connections for callers from July 1st uh, of 2019 through June 30th, 2020, down from 274,000 uh, calls the previous year and short of its 268,600 target. Um, could you explain you know, what those connections to care look like and how is this information tracked um, what, and what does the follow-up look like? I'm sorry, there's like three questions there. This is more for Susan. Hillary, are you, are you, who is this question for? Susan. Okay. Um, NYC well question. All right. So to answer it, it's fine. To, I'll, I'll start and perhaps Hillary Cunnins will jump in. Let me, let me give a little bit of context here. Uh, the MMR pointed to targets that were raised um, in the latter part of the year. We met the target that was set in the PMMR. Um, we added new resources to NYC Well, anticipating that there would be greater need. And we did not make the annualized target that was then set after the new resources were made. But some context here I think is important. First of all, that target is for calls, texts, and chats. And what I, one of the lessons that I think we've learned, and Dr. Cunnins mentioned this when she was talking about how we've been really sort of excited to realize how much people are taking up virtual and telemental health services and how much people are accessing the information and the resources they need in different ways. I would just say two things. First, in April of, 2020, we had 120,000 visits to the NYC Well website, which is about a 400% increase from the April the year before. Mm -hmm. So the target is about calls, texts, and chats. But I would say that we have an enormous number of people who seem to be getting what they need by going to the website, finding resources, and going there directly. And that's good. Um, however people access services is a good thing. Absolutely. The, second, the second thing I would say is that we welcomed the fact that during this pandemic, the state created its own COVID related helpline. And whenever we advertised NYC Well during the pandemic, we advertised the state helpline as well. So again, we're very happy to have people access services no matter what door they walk through. So that's a little bit of context here. I think, I think the website is serving people very, very well. Um, we are still getting over around a thousand calls, texts and chats a day. That's, that's a lot of people who are reaching out to us. So we're very pleased with what's happening. I, I think I've mentioned this at a previous hearing, but uh, I had a, a young lady that uh, suffers from anxiety and she, she acts and she was like, you know, who do I go to? I don't, you know, I don't have a, a therapist at the moment. And I said, well, have you tried? I was actually trying to like low key undercover, see how effective, uh, the, the, the call center is. And, uh, she actually, uh, was very impressed with it. I didn't share any information beforehand, um, and was, uh, very pleased with the outcome of the call and felt that, you know, in the moment she was having a, a very serious panic attack that the person that she was talking to helped help, you know, kind of walk through it. And um, she actually texted back and said, why didn't you share this information with me sooner? Um, <laughs> I wish that I had known. Um, but I yeah. think that that's always something that we struggle with is how do we, how do we ensure that as many people that need these services know that these services are readily available? I think I, I, I will acknowledge that I've seen um, NYC well, pretty well promoted throughout 
uh, my community and the people that I have spoken to seem to be, um, you know, very, respond very well to the, the the services that are being rendered. But when you when when you talk about uh, connecting um, supportive uh, connections, what does that mean? How, what, what type of services are you connecting individuals to? So first of all, when somebody calls NYC well, they are talking to either a trained counselor or a trained peer, depending on what their choice is. And sometimes that conversation, that supportive counseling is, is all they want and need. Sometimes people want to be referred to either individual counseling or group counseling. And as you can, by looking at the website, they'll ask you where you are, whether you want to receive services in your own neighborhood or a neighborhood where you frequent, um, and any particular kind of service that you're looking for, and they will offer you resources. And what we know from surveying people who have called NYC well, and they're surveyed by people other than the person who spoke to them, is that we're not only offering services to at least a thousand people a day, but we're offering good services. People are satisfied, they feel helped, and they're satisfied with the service. So we have, um, we're getting very good feedback from people. I agree. Has, do you find that has out, well, has outreach um, in communities that were highly impacted by COVID uh, increased? And if so, uh, is that outreach in, in linguistically appropriate for those communities? We are doing outreach in all the languages that the city recommends. I don't, I don't remember whether it's eight, but in all the languages, we advertise in local um, ethnic press, local media, text messages sent out by the city. We had um, television PSAs in the early times of the pandemic. We also use the email lists that many other parts of city government use. So the community affairs officers at the NYPD sent out information about NYC well. The community affairs unit um, in City Hall sent out repeated messages about NYC well. We've sent out messages about it from um, the uh, health providers around the city radio messages, radio PSAs, we've really, we've reached out in numerous ways. Now, did you, did, I don't, I'm not sure if you, if you track this data, but did you see an increase in the number of young people that were use, utilizing NYC well as a, as a tool? I have to get back to you about young people, but I, my guess would be that they are using the website very frequently. I mean, I would imagine also, that they're texters, so they, they might, yeah, you know, yeah, um, find it convenient, but, uh, but it brings, uh, you know, case, uh, it brings to mind if, if, is, is Thrive, um, is, is Thrive working uh, in tandem with the Department of Education to ensure that our, you know, young people are aware of these resources? We are, we have been. We also, um, I mean, I think we, we may get into that later, but we are, we have, trained teachers in social and emotional learning. Part of that training is also knowing where to refer people if um, necessary and how to do that. Uh, we have provided um, and will be, you'll, you'll see soon, sort of a release of new, new campaigns to reach young people specifically rather than just adults. But we also produced, the Office of Thrive produced a guide for how to access mental health resources while staying at home. And if you go on our website, as about 38,000 people have um, looked at this guide since the pandemic began, you'll see that the guide is divided into sections. So there's special resources for veterans, there's special resources for older New Yorkers, and there's special resources laid out for children, and young adults. And um, that message, the existence of this guide has gone out to all city agencies so that they are also telling all of the people that they reach in their own networks. Um, and it's certainly part of what DOE 
knows about and can access. We've also created special publications for the DOE, specifically on dating abuse and domestic violence geared to young people. And we worked with NGBV on that, Mayor's mm -hmm. Office um, to Prevent Gender and um, Gender-Based Violence. And um, is that a new know, service? All of these things is what a new service. Are all those new services? All of these guides? Yeah. These are all things that we did during the pandemic to make sure we were reaching everybody as well as possible. We had, we had everything from phone banking to flyering in general, putting flyers and, and one sheeters into some of the food that was distributed around the city to um, putting flyers under doors in NYCHA housing. Um, we tried to reach everybody in every way that we could as our services were continuing. So um, in the executive budget, the fiscal year 2020 budget was increased um, by 3.8 million for the expansion of NYC well. However, in fiscal year 2021 ad adopted budget, the budget decreased to 12.6 million. Does that impact the number of counselors it will not have an impact on the number of counselors. We added resources so that NYC Well could add staff and we're just monitoring the situation. And if we need to adjust the budget again, we will. Okay. Um, I, I don't know who, who would respond to this, but with the number of individuals that were released from, the, um, from, from Rikers Island specifically and from some of the local community uh, jails during the pandemic uh, of those individuals that required connection and services um, for behavioral health services how how were those connections uh made considering that you know most of the world went virtual at the same time so one of the um groups of people that we have identified are particularly vulnerable are people returning to communities from some form of detention or incarceration, which is why, again, the guide has a separate section for people who are justice involved or returning to communities. We've given information to all of the alternatives to incarceration organizations, the Mayor's Office of Criminal Justice to Correctional Health Services. They all know what kind of resources are available, which agencies are particularly attuned to that population and which ones have mental health services in particular. So hey, we've done yeah, very yeah. targeted work to make sure that they can refer people to the organizations that will serve okay. them. Now, one of the concerns that we had with the transition of individuals from shelter setting to hotels was that there may be individuals that were uh, being housed differently that had behavioral health needs. Um, that would now be isolated and alone in private rooms in a hotel setting. Um, I'm, I'm sure that that proved to be challenging as well, but I'm curious to see how, um, you know, sh services were shifted to uh, address and ensure that those individuals living in shelter were not um, deprived of mental health and uh, behavioral health services. Services shifted with those individuals, as just as you said, it was very challenging. It is challenging. We've put Thrive has funded clinicians in a hundred family shelters and added to some of the mobile treatment teams, mobile crisis teams, and mobile treatment teams that serve in large part, certainly the mobile treatment teams in large part, serving people who experience homelessness. And all of that work, um, trying to serve people where they are, whether it's on the street or in a shelter, um, has been helpful and has continued during the pandemic. One thing I think is important to note is that the, the work that we do um, in conjunction with DOHMH and h, &H to bolster the level of field services that we provide as a city um, you often hear about it in terms of people who are or have serious mental illness and they're not able to participate in mental health treatment regularly at a clinic and so we go to them 
and try and keep them engaged in therapy. And that's true. And that's the fundamental purpose of those teams. But all of those teams in their work with people um, are working to help everything that contributes to the mental health of that person, including housing insecurity. So one of our teams, the intensive mobile treatment team, that one particular kind of team who serve the people who are have really the most difficulty staying engaged in services in large part because they're transient, a population that's, that's moving around. Those teams have seen 48% of their clients who had experienced homelessness before they were engaged with those teams then have access to and be living in stable housing. So we're not only helping their mental health situation, we're helping their housing situation, which in turn bolsters their mental health. Hillary, did you want to add something to that? I thought I saw you raise your hand. Uh, yes, I saw those, um, Susan covered it beautifully. Um, I did want to just add that we, um, during the making sure that folks in shelter and in hotels had access to all the services that they need. We closely coordinated with Department of Homeless Services, with um, NISM, Emergency Management, with uh, Mayor's Office of Criminal Justice to really be able to deliver to people in hotels in isolation, whether it was ongoing care or new care that they needed for behavioral health as we're speaking about today, but other services as well. We were very closely partnering uh, with those agencies to make sure that every service we have in contract, Susan mentioned some of them, uh, was available for, cl for clients or New Yorkers who needed to isolate or quarantine. I'll also add, we worked closely with Department of Homeless Services. We used at the, uh, during the, 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 the height of the cases, um, did wellness checks by telephone to people in isolation. And in that way, we're able to offer general support, but also to identify unmet behavioral health or other needs. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, the, so I'm, I'm a little bit, so I, one question that I had that I don't, I don't think I, I, I really, um, I asked uh, appropriately um, was regarding the shuttering of the psychiatric beds. So we've received a lot of, of, of calls of concern and, um, and I actually didn't even realize that the psychiatric beds had been, um, had been shut down. Um, how has that affected uh, the delivery of service? Are those beds now, um, you know, active? Are they are they back? Are they available? Um, since you know, since the pandemic seems to have kind of, you know, settled a little bit, and the, the need for those beds for COVID patients um, isn't as dire. Right. So just just also to be clear, the beds were mostly converted to beds for physical health, intensive care unit, and so forth. They were not. Um, you know, simply shuttered, just to, just to clarify, uh, by and large. Um, <clears throat> so as you know, the state controls bed authorization. Um, and so they uh, have, um, have been more clearly uh, doing that regulation. However, we've been in very close contact with them to uh, both bring concerns from the city as well as to understand what the future plans are for those beds. So, as I understand it, some have reopened, some have continued uh, to be made available for potential resurgence. Um, we have not heard uh, specific issues around longer wait times um, uh, for psychiatric beds, but we, I would say, share your concern and, and are talking about it with the state and will continue to do so. So how was an individual that was picked up that with your psychiatric needs and maybe needed inpatient uh, treated it, or triaged if those beds were not available? So some, some were open throughout the pandemic, just to be clear. So in some cases it might have necessitated, for example, a transfer to another, another site, sometimes 
and ideally within the institution where the person came into the, you know, in, in the system that the person might have come into the emergency department, sometimes needing to go outside that system. Do you know how many psychiatric beds off the top of your head? I don't, I don't remember. How many psychiatric I, beds? I'd have, have to talk to you. Can you, I don't and, know. and in comparison, how many of those beds we lost throughout the pandemic? I'll have to get back to you on that. I, I'd appreciate that. All right, I'm not sure if any of my colleagues have any further questions. Um, the council member Borelli, I don't think, yeah, I don't think he's with us anymore. Um, okay, well, thank you guys. Thank you so much. I think, um, you know, uh, again, I would love to, to have um, an offline conversation, I think about uh, the, the current state of the city and, um, you know, most specifically communities where we've seen a significant increase in, um, in, in, in drug use and public drug use. I'm really concerned about uh, ensuring that those individuals are, you know, have access to the resources that they had pre-COVID um, and that, you know, we're not losing sight of them, you know, in the midst of all of the other priorities uh, that we that are competing with each other at the moment. I think that, you know, this is a public health crisis within another public health crisis, and we need to acknowledge it as such. Um, and we at the council are committed, as always, to doing our part and helping, um, you know, the, 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 both agencies uh, to do the best job possible um, because your success is our success. And so I thank you for coming and testifying today. Thank you. Thank you very much. That concludes the questions for this panel. Uh, we will now turn to public testimony. All public testimony will be limited to three minutes. After I call your name, please wait a brief moment for the Sergeant at Arms to announce that you may begin before starting your testimony. The first panel will include Ravi Reddy, Zainab Tawil, and Joy Lungaxi. Uh, as soon as you hear your name, wait for the sergeant and you can begin once he unmutes you. I would also like to remind any council members who have a question that they can use the Zoom raise hand function to ask a question of any particular panel and they will ask after all three panelists go. So we'll beginning with Ravi Reddy and as soon as the Sergeant cues you, you can begin. Thank you. Time begins now. My name is Ravi Reddy and I'm the Associate Director for Advocacy and Policy at the Asian American Federation. I wanna thank the committee for holding this important hearing. Our community needs now more than ever culturally competent mental health services and robust mental health reporting. The COVID-19 pandemic has resulted in a 35% increase in deaths compared to the five-year average and a 6,000% increase in Asian unemployment claims compared to this time last year. The economic damage hit our small businesses harder and earlier than the general economy, and many of our seniors won't leave their homes due to rising anti-Asian harassment and violence. Since 2000, the Asian population in New York City increased by 51%, and two out of three in our community in the city are foreign-born. So simply put, combined with an Asian poverty rate of 14.1% in the city, rates of senior poverty higher than the city average, and almost one in two Asian New Yorkers having limited English proficiency, the mental health crisis in our community is real and getting worse. And while Intro Bill 2005 has the potential to be impactful, robust mental health reporting will likely show that an important feedback loop is broken. Our mental health providers, while managing their own stress, anxiety, and depression, are balancing their personal well being with the well being of our community. Our partners are conducting thousands of wellness calls, adding mental health check ins to other basic needs work like meal deliveries, and continue to provide low income Asian New Yorkers with innumerable services. But from 2002 to 2014, the Asian American community received a mere 1.4% of the total dollar value of New York City social service contracts and 0.2% of DOHMH contract dollars. 
Before the pandemic, Asian senior programs were receiving only 2.7% of the total dip to contract dollars, and no Asian nonprofit has their own meals contract, always serving as a subcontractor. This process has, was broken long before the pandemic, but the kind of mental health legislation being proposed here provides an opportunity to reconstitute it as it always should have been, a process where data accurately rep represents the breadth and efficacy of community-driven mental health approaches, and then drives greater funding to programs that work, like like those of our partners who will be speaking shortly. To that end, our questions regarding Intro Bill 2005 focus on systemic issues in the city's reporting mechanisms. Questions the city should ask include what kind of data will be collected, how will it be collected, who will be collected, who will be expected to provide the data, and what will the data represent. And we must be clear, any additional reporting cannot contribute to the already significant burdens being placed on our community service partners without additional funding and capacity. Data gathering that can accurately measure the impact of community driven programs are necessary to give us a wider perspective of the level of need and types of services that work for the Asian community, like the incorporation of mental health into services like food delivery for seniors and other non clinical programs. And as an extension of the conversation on this bill, significant long-term investment should prioritize Asian-led, Asian-serving, community-based organizations that are already doing the work. Time has expired. With our community and in within our community and in enabling other mental service providers to expand culturally competent mental health capacities. Without expanded culturally competent services, which allow for greater points of access, there are fewer ways to collect accurate data and the Asian community will continue to be rendered invisible by existing data collection. Robust data gathering and programs at work should be part of the same process. So on behalf of the AAF, I wanna thank you for letting us speak with you about COVID-19's impact on our community and how we can move forward together. Policies regarding mental health service delivery require nuanced discussion, and we look forward to working with the committee and individual council members to make sure New Yorkers of every background get the mental health services they need. Thank you. Thank you, Robbie. Thank you so much for that. Thank you. Our next panelist will be Zainab Tawil. You can begin after the sergeant cues you. Thank you. Time begins. Hello, Chairperson. Ayala, members of the Committee on Mental Health, Disabilities and Addiction. I wanna thank you guys so much for the opportunity to testify before you here today. My name is Zainab Tawil and I'm a mental health caseworker with the Arab American Association of New York. To say that there is a profound mental health crisis in New York's Arab American community would be an understatement. Since our organization was founded nearly 20 years ago, the lack of mental health um, care available to Arab Americans and the stigma surrounding accessing it has done a great deal of harm in our community. For years, families and lives have been irrep irreparably damaged as a result of lack of access to affordable, accessible mental health care for Arab Americans. And as a result of that, working to alleviate this crisis has been a cornerstone of AAA and Y's work. Since the beginning of the COVID-19 pandemic, these challenges have intensified severely. Families and individuals in our community are starting to crack under the pressures of loss of income, at-home schooling, domestic quarantine, and countless other mental health stressors caused by COVID-19. Repairing the damage to mental health this pandemic has done is work that will take years. The legislation being considered here today, though, is a critical first step. By creating the first concrete measures of this pandemic's effect on mental health, we can start to develop programming to combat these effects and hopefully speed recovery for millions across New York. Arab Americans of all ages and from all backgrounds have been acutely affected by the mental health effects of this crisis. Of particular worry though is the alarming jump in incidents of domestic and partner violence, both reported and unreported, our community has seen. It is an unfortunate truth that in some traditional Arab households, it is all too common that women can find themselves victimized at the hands of abusive partners who wield absolute power over their lives. Before COVID, organizations like AAANY provided women at risk of falling into these situations with resources and information that could protect, protect them from abuse. And we have fought to keep doing so throughout COVID-19. However, at-home quarantine, loss of access to culturally acceptable spaces outside the home and increasing household tensions surrounding at-home schooling and loss of partner income have put thousands of Arab women quite literally in situations where their lives are on the line. In my work, clients I have seen my, in my work with clients, I have seen a shocking number of women I work with reporting partner abuse. Even more alarming though is the number of women in abusive relationships my colleagues and I were working with before the pandemic who have now stopped reaching out to us altogether due to their partners cutting off access. 
At, the, at this pandemic shuts down doors and cuts off our community from mental health resources, we anticipate these negative impacts will increase and intensify, intensify the longer the crisis goes on. While it is clear that COVID has severely impacted the severity of our community's mental health crisis, without concrete measurements of this impact, it will be impossible for us to shift to programming to address these new challenges. In providing exactly this bill, it will not only help organizations like AAA and Y, will, but, but will give a voice to countless victims of domestic violence good. suffering behind closed doors. We wanna thank you again. As we approach the grim hallmark of 200,000 Americans dead due to COVID-19, we must keep focused on our city's recovery after this is all over and ensure that mental health and well-being of our city is essential to recovering and rebuilding in the wake of this crisis. Thank you guys so much. Thank you so much. That was great. Thank you. Our next panelist is Joy Longfoxe. Time begins. Oh, sorry. Good afternoon. My name is Joy Longfoxe. I am the Assistant Executive Director of Hamilton Madison House. We are a nonprofit settlement house located in the Lower East Side, and we're the largest outpatient behavioral health provider for Asian Americans on the East Coast. Currently, we operate five mental health clinics, a personalized recovery oriented service program, and a supportive housing program for individuals with mental illness um, in, in two locations in Manhattan and Queens. Our staff are bilingual, and we provide services in Chinese, Korean, Japanese, Cambodian, and, um, and Vietnamese. In the last decades, Asian Americans continue to be the fastest growing population in the New York metropolitan area. Approximately 70% of Asians in New York City are immigrants. Currently in ha at Hamilton Man Madison House, behavioral health programs, including our mental health and addiction services, 80% of our program clients identify as first-generation immigrants and and report um, challenges as contributing factors to their mental health symptoms. For Asian Americans, access to behavioral health care is already a challenge faced by a variety of factors from lower utilization rates, becoming a cultural stigma to a lack of funding for culturally linguistic competent providers. As the number of COVID cases increases, so did the symptoms of anxiety and depression. In our mental health clinics, we saw a 25% increase of referrals since March, 2020. Many of the clients seeking services for the first time, meaning they never sought services prior to COVID-19. We found that other providers were not accepting new patients due to the increase in demand, as well as private practitioners, such as private psychiatrists, closing their practice during the pandemic, causing a greater burden on organizations like Hamilton Madison House to backfill the clients that were left in limbo. During admissions, 30% of the clients reported in their first time seeking mental health services only sought treatment as it was their affecting their ability to seek, to ability to sleep or manage tasks in their daily life due to fears about COVID-19. They also reported not being aware of any, or newly admitted client had been hospitalized due to severe depression and with suicide ideation due to his recent job loss during COVID-19. In a utilization review of our programs in the last six months, HMH conducted analysis of program trends. 20% of the HMH charts reviews indicated an increase in mental health symptoms due to anxiety over financials, affordable housing, and potential employment loss due to COVID. The findings concluded that clients have also not received mental health services until approximately two months after their onset of the symptoms. After clients were not able to seek service in their native language, therefore, they were not able to receive um, they were not able to avoid me uh, measures in increasing their mental health symptoms. At HMH, we have always made it a priority to, for prevention and education. In the first months of COVID-19, we provided trainings for providers and caregivers on elder abuse, trauma-informed therapy, and overall general strategies on how to support loved ones with anxiety and depression. We increased our number of weekly contacts with clients with clinicians to conduct brief check-ins to provide resources that meet, meet, meet their concrete needs. Hamilton Madison House would like to recommend the following solutions to help our communities overcome the barrier in accessing services. Due to the, the stigma of mental health service in the Asian community, please make resources available in various languages. At this time, funding for wraparound services such as case, case management is required. Increased capacity and funding for mental health providers to integrate additional support service into the treatment of care. This also complete, uh, includes support groups, mentorship, legal aid, and benefits counseling. Increase access to mental health services by funding organizations that have the ability to 
train and educate providers in other languages. We strongly urge the Committee on Mental Health, Disabilities and Addictions not to forget about the Asian population and address these growing issues by allocating appropriate funding, funding to increase mental health resources to our community. Thank you. Thank you, Joy. Um, so I hear this a lot and I just, I wanted to kind of gauge from you guys. So is, is, is access to, to, a pro, to um, is language access the biggest impediment to access to care in your network? I think that they're, they're muted, Zara. Um, right now, our, the services that our clients are not able to receive is access to language services. There's a huge stigma, like I shared, um, in our community and finding providers that speak their language, both therapists and psychiatrics um, providers have been very difficult. Um, a lot of the providers that are not in our clinic have actually wait lists and, or have not accepted any new clients, so yes. Of the, of the client, uh, Ravi? Ravi had something to add. Um, and I also just, you know, going off what Joyce said, you know, I think, you know, at, at a higher altitude, there are a lot, a lot of systemic challenges. So figuring out which impediments is kind of the greatest, um, you know, there are the immediate critical needs, but then there's also, um, you know, cultural stigma. There are um, funding streams that have been neglected for quite some time before the pandemic. And we're seeing a lot of weaknesses in our service streams because of that, especially when, you know, this crisis is hitting us disproportionately. We actually have information showing that our small businesses have been were closed down earlier and harder. And, you know, the, you know, across our community, we're seeing the mental health needs show up in different ways and are being impacted by different systematic factors. So I can get you more information on that afterwards um, from our organization as well. I'd appreciate it. Thank you so much. Okay, Zara, I think we'll go for the next panel. Thank you very much to this panel. Our next panel will include Alice Bufkin, Lauren Curatolo and Jamil Hamilton. Um, as before, please wait for your name to be called and then the host will unmute you and the sergeant will cue you to begin. So we'll begin with Alice Bufkin. When the sergeant cues you, you can begin. Thank you. Time begins now. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Alice Buckin. I am the Director of Policy for Child and Adolescent Health at Citizens Committee for Children. We're a multi-issue children's advocacy organization committed to ensuring every New York child is healthy, housed, educated, and safe. I'd like to thank Cherry Alla and all the members of this committee for holding this really important hearing today. I'll be submitting some written comments with additional detail, but during my time today, I want to touch on a few items. First, COVID-19 has undoubtedly exacerbated the behavioral health needs of New Yorkers and children in particular, um, but it's important to acknowledge that even prior to this pandemic, far too many children lacked access to adequate behavioral health services. In our state, suicide is the second leading cause of death for children 15 to 19, and half of children with a mental or behavioral health diagnosis don't receive the treatment that they need. Um, we heard some really valuable data from DOHMH today. We also know that the CDC has been re releasing its pulse data uh, post-COVID, um, and in some of that data, they found that almost half of uh, youth in the New York metropolitan statistical area, age 18 to 24, um, experienced depression or anxiety. About a quarter seriously considered suicide in the past week. Um, that's higher than any other age group. So as we've heard today, the factors driving um, these spike include things like family job loss and economic insecurity, loss of loved ones, lack of access to mental health services, toxic stress of racism. Um, so as the city council and the mayor consider how to address many of these challenges, we offer a few recommendations. Um, first, we recognize that the city has been placed in an untenable position given the economic crisis. We join many city leaders in urging the state to explore revenue options and to extend borrowing authority to New York City. However, even barring additional state and federal assistance, we believe that austerity now will inhibit recovery and risk long-term harm to marginalized children and families. We need to protect those services families rely on to weather these hardships. That includes those services in DOH and in community-based organizations that offer behavioral health services and other supports. One area where we've already seen budget cuts impact social and emotional supports for young children is the proposed cuts to community schools. As you know, community schools provides a host of social services to tens of thousands of students, including services that are trauma-informed and designed to center student emotional and mental well-being. We can't claim a true investment in the social, emotional, and mental health of students, while at the same time cutting the very services that help support them. We therefore urge the city council and city leadership to prevent the proposed community schools cuts from taking effect. 
Um, the newly proposed bridge to school plan provides a really valuable trauma-informed framework for schools. Um, we do think we need uh, additional targeted supports and services to students, families, and educators so that they can uh, make these uh, proposals a reality. We also believe that investments in whole school approaches need to be accompanied by strong clinical support for those students who have a higher level of need. And to truly support students, schools must recognize that many students are facing new trauma as a result of COVID and that punitive disciplinary practices like suspensions, expulsions, and involvement of the police are not appropriate responses to children's behavioral health needs. Um, and the last thing I'll just say is that without tackling the digital divide, we really won't see equitable access to behavioral health supports and other supports as well. So I just wanna thank you for your time today. Thank you. Thank you so much. You guys are doing such great work. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Our next panelist will be Lauren Curatolo. And as before, when you hear the Sergeant cue your name, you can begin your testimony. Thank you. You can begin as soon as you're cued. Time begins now. Good afternoon, Chair Ayala and members of the committee. Um, my name is Lauren Curatolo. I'm so happy to be here to talk briefly about the critical work that the Center for Court Innovation has been doing during this devastating time. Um, we all know that this time has disproportionately impacted people of color, people in the communities that we serve. So the Brooklyn Mental Health Court, Bronx Community Solutions, and the Midtown Community Court, where I serve as director, have done tremendous, tremendous work to ensure that clients have had continuous access to mental health services, overdose prevention services, and harm reduction services. I know that our written submission details just some of the work that's being done center-wide. I would like to focus on um, a pilot program that the Midtown Community Court, in partnership with Fountain House and Midtown North Precinct, along with the NYPD's Behavioral Health Unit, has been working on. It's really exciting. It's called Midtown's Rapid Engagement Program. As you know, on January 1st, New York's uh, bail reform legislation went into effect. And as a result, thousands of individuals are now being released with desk appearance tickets from police precincts and asked to return in ordinary times uh, to court 21 days later um, for their arraignment. So for many individuals who are living with serious mental illness, drug addiction, housing instability, food insecurity, and who may be encountering the police at a moment of crisis and need immediate support, this moment of arrest is critical. So Midtown Rep, this program would fill a gap that currently exists in staff, by staffing a social worker and a peer navigator on call to the Midtown North Precinct who would engage individuals in voluntary services after that person is released from the precinct. Um, we're really thrilled about uh, this partnership and we've been spending a lot of time working uh, with Fountain House and with the NYPD to see how we can make this um, project really work for people who are going to need critical services at the time of their arrest. And really our social workers at the center are the experts in supporting people living with mental illness and drug addiction issues, along with linking them to the stellar community-based organizations that we partner with and have um, really strong relationships that we've uh, built over the last 25 years as Midtown Community Court. Um, so we're really looking forward to rolling out this pilot in the coming months and um, having the support of council as we do that. So thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it. And thank you for letting me be here to talk. Thank you, Lauren. And if we can be helpful, please feel free to reach out. Thank you very much. Our next panelist will be Jamil Hamilton. Uh, and as soon as you're cued by the Sergeant, you can begin. Thank you. Time begins now. Thank you to the members of the City Council for the opportunity to submit this testimony today. My name is Jamil Hamilton and I am the Manager of Public Policy and Advocacy for the National Alliance on Mental Illness of New York City, better known as NAMI New York City. For nearly 40 years, NAMI New York City has been committed to helping families and individuals affected by mental illness build better lives through education, support, and advocacy. Through our helpline, education classes, support groups, public education programs, and other programs and services, we were able to impact the lives of over 29,000 people in fiscal year 2020, which is a 52% increase over fiscal year 2019. During the COVID-19 crisis, the importance of healthcare access has never been more clear. Unfortunately, mental health care is often excluded from COVID-19 public health response plans. Let's be clear, mental health is public health. 
Nami New York City strongly believes mental health care must be a key component of our city's COVID-19 recovery plans. The COVID-19 pandemic is a traumatic event that is impacting the mental health of nearly everyone. And Nami New York City has seen firsthand the increased need for mental health care services during this time. During the last two weeks of March alone, we saw a 60% increase in the number of calls to our helpline. And that increase has held steady in the six months since. The pandemic is not only impacting families and individuals already familiar with, with mental illness, we are also receiving inquiries from individuals who have never experienced a mental health challenge prior to COVID-19. The constant stress of worrying about finances, health, and over, overall quality of life is taking a large toll on the emotional and mental well-being of New Yorkers. Now more than ever, we need the city council to invest in mental health care and ensure all New Yorkers are able to access the quality mental health services they need and deserve. The city council must work to minimize health care disruptions by ensuring that psychiatric units and other mental health care facilities have proper levels of staffing, PPE, and beds. We are hearing far too many stories from health care providers and patients who say that, health, that hospital psychiatric units are reducing their capacity, discharging patients prematurely, or closing altogether. Some examples of closures, which we've talked about already, include New York Presbyterian Brooklyn, Brooklyn Methodist Hospital, which closed their psychiatric unit, New York Presbyterian Hospital, uh, New York Presbyterian Allen, which is in uh, Inwood, they closed their psychiatric and detox unit, and Northwell Health Methadone Clinic has closed. We asked the city council to conduct an investigation to why this is happening and what can be done to prevent it. NAMI New York City believes legislation introduced by Councilmember Lewis is an excellent first step towards understanding the impa impact of COVID-19 on New Yorkers. In addition, we believe the City Council should work to commission a comprehensive task force to thoroughly understand the current state of mental health in New York City and what policy changes should be implemented to improve it. This task force should re release updates regularly and should include representatives from city agencies, community organizations, providers, and families and individuals impacted by mental illness. Finally, NAMI New York City believes it is crucial that the city council increase funding for mental health care services. We understand the historic budget challenges facing the city, but we cannot balance our city's budget on the backs of the most vulnerable New Yorkers. Now more than ever, we must invest in community organizations like NAMI New York City that are providing critical mental health services and supports. We are working harder than ever to provide, ser to provide services to more people than ever, but we cannot do it alone. We need support from city council to make sure we can provide education and support to the ever-increasing amount of New Yorkers impacted by mental health challenges. As always, NAMI New York City is ready to partner and work with the city council members to find solutions and make sure mental health is a key component of COVID-19 crisis response plans. Thank you for your time and please do not hesitate to reach out if we can be of further assistance. Thank you. I will definitely be um, calling you, uh, Jamil, um, but I have a question, the Inwood beds, um, I know that there was a, a reduction in the number of psychiatric unit um, beds pre-pandemic. Are you are you suggesting that they that the remaining um, beds were also taken offline? From our understanding, and we've been working with NAMI New York State and NISNA, the, the New York State Nurses Association, our understanding is that all the beds have been um, closed, but there, this process has been very uh, opaque and not very transparent. So, you know, we could have the wrong information, but unfortunately, because it's not a transparent process, we're not, we're not quite sure. But what, from what our, our latest information, it's closed. So folks in that area, which is a working class area and predominantly people of color, they now don't have access to these inpatient services. Understood. Thank you so much. Thank you for that. Absolutely. Thank you to this panel. Our next panel will include Hindi Hecht, Ronald Richter, and Nadia Chait. As before, when you hear your name, please wait for the sergeant to cue you and you'll be unmuted and you can begin. Hindi Hecht will be the first to go. Uh, as soon as the sergeant cues you, you can begin your testimony. Thank you. Time begins now. Hindi, you're muted, hold on. Can you try to unmute yourself? Mm -hmm. You came in and out. Try it again. Can somebody help her? How about now? There you go, yes. You hear me? We're good? Okay, give me one second, okay. Um, again, my name is Hindi Hecht. I am the Director of Operations and Community Services at OHEL Children's Home and Family Services. Uh, as we've all seen, the pandemic is stressing an already stressed population. 
Normal has been redefined. A baseline of anxiety has become the new normal. For many who never experienced anxiety prior to COVID-19, there's a heightened anxiety among those who have been experiencing anxiety pre-pandemic. And for those who are managing their mild symptoms pri prior to the outbreak, the COVID-19 experience has pushed them over the edge. During a time of increased isolation and tension, people struggling with managing addiction have become destabilized. Drug deaths are increasing the COVID-related fatalities. Those that are not dying from coronavirus, but have conditions secondary to COVID. There has been an uptick in drug overdoses with many struggling with mental health issues, self-medicating in isolation with no one to call for help. Support systems have become dismantled. For many, the multi-pronged interventions that have sustained them have been reduced solely to medication. Group therapies have stopped, in-person visits have stopped. Many of those with mental illness reportedly do not have access to technology that would enable them to participate in remote mental health visits via telehealth. The term social distancing has created greater barriers. The need is for physical distancing, but the need is for social connectedness. Social distancing has created further isolation, loneliness, urgency, and desperation on the part of those who are facing mental health issues. At OHEL, during the height of the pandemic, we saw a huge uptick in calls related to anxiety and depression. Our community is suffering. Women living in abusive relationships afraid to leave, afraid to stay. Those living with mental health challenges desperate for interventions. Parents feel fearful of their children who have severe mental health challenges which have led to violence in the home. And the everyday people in our community who are finding themselves so challenged. A man in his 30s in medical school who has depression had been managing his symptoms well, but called us at a loss because his school and library were closed due to COVID. These places were his haven where he escaped from his dysfunctional and chaotic home in order to study. He was extremely anxious that he would fail his medical exam, which he had been working so hard toward. An executive at a long-term care facility with no history of mental health issues was experiencing a severe panic attack and anxiety related to COVID. He was terrified for the well-being of his patients and staff and felt the crushing burden to develop a plan that would ensure the safety of those under his care. The anxiety was crippling him and preventing him from doing his job. The woman with anxiety who was managing her symptoms so well, holding down an excellent job, COVID triggered overwhelming anxiety in her, not due to fear of the illness, but the fear over the economy of needing to support her family, fear of the unknown. She wanted to go to sleep early as was her only respite from her anxiety, but at this point, even sleep eluded her. And the stories go on. As the presentation of heightened mental health issues continues to trend upward, we must see an uptick in mental health services in order to meet the increased need. OHEL needs continued support in order to expand our work with the community, in order to reduce the stigma, provide the necessary services, and return our members to health, both emotionally and physically. Thank you. Thank you, Hindi, and thank you for your services. Thank you very much. The next panelist will be Ronald Richter. As soon as you're unmuted and the Sergeant cues you, you can begin with your testimony. Thank you very much. Time begins now. Thank you, Sergeant, and thank you, Chair Ayala and members of the Council Committee on Mental Health, Disabilities and Addiction. Uh, we so appreciate you taking the time uh, for this hearing, drawing attention to the issue of increased drug overdose, depression, and anxiety during COVID-19. Thank you, Council Member Lewis, for introduction 2005, which would require the city to report on numbers of formally diagnosed uh, or mental health related cases disaggregated by age, race, and gender. Uh, I am the chief executive of JCCA, which has been working uh, with New York's most vulnerable children and families since 1822. We see firsthand the value of children's behavioral health services, child and family treatment support services, home and community based services, and are always advocating for an expansion of children's mental health services as part of Medicaid redesign. Our skilled service providers work directly with vulnerable young people in their homes, schools, and communities. We provide support to help clients engage with schools, receive consistent medical and behavioral treatment, and avoid hospitalizations, avoid foster care, avoid placements, in higher levels of care. As you've heard today, and I'm sure before today, the stress of this pandemic is overwhelming and hitting our clients and communities 
that are already adversely affected by decades of systemic racism, over-policing, and disinvestment in schools, social services, and infrastructure. Many come from New York's uh, communities where there is extraordinary resilience, extraordinary strength, extraordinary creativity, yet we see adverse childhood experiences resulting in the kinds of damage that COVID did. What are our recommendations? Support for intro 2005. Trauma-informed care. Children's mental health services should be expanded to include children in child health plus, eliminating barriers to access to care and service provision. Partner with schools to provide support to children as schools address the challenges of providing education during the pandemic. Imagine trying to read and struggling with the trauma of COVID and learning virtually. Imagine being in foster care and moving from place to place while doing this. Integrate children's mental health services into frontline care, such as food banks, housing organizations, and finally, fully fund the indirect rate for nonprofit organizations. Thank you so much for your time and this opportunity. And thank you council members for the work you do every day. Chair Ayala, it is great to see you. Thank you. Thank you so much. You actually, um, I, you have a lot of really great points. Um, I, you know, I have children in, in school as well and I, I don't remember getting a wellness check call um, throughout the, 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 the last year. And I think it's, it's important because, you know, children are impacted by many of the things that, you know, they are um, experiencing at home and in their communities. Um, and I know just dating back a few months um, while in the midst of the pandemic, everyone in my house was like sick with COVID and the teachers were texting away, you know, you need to do your homework, you need to do this, you need to do that. And there was no empathy or um, even an acknowledgement, right, that a lot of these, these, these kids were living in a household that were, you know, impacted where individuals were, you know, sick, where individuals were dying, um, where there was food insecurity, where domestic violence was a real issue. Um, so I, I thank you for that because um, it's not something that we touched on today, but I think it's something that we definitely need to uh, monitor uh, more closely. So thank you. Thank you very much. I, I, I know you appreciate that children take their cues from adults and adults have been super anxious and stressed and depressed and kids feel that. Kids who are nonverbal feel that. And, you know, our schools really need to, to be aware of that and to be checking in. So Absolutely. we appreciate you. Thank Absolutely. you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Our next panelist is Nadia Chait. Uh, as soon as you're unmuted and the sergeant cues you, you can begin your testimony. Thank you. Time begins now. Good afternoon, Chair Ayala and distinguished members of the council, and thank you for the opportunity to testify today. I'm Nadia Chait, the Associate Director of Policy and Advocacy at the Coalition for Behavioral Health. The coalition represents over 100 community-based mental health and substance use providers who collectively serve over 600,000 New Yorkers annually. Um, as has been highlighted today, the COVID-19 pandemic has presented an incredible challenge both for the clients we serve and for the providers who are working every day to serve them. This has been compounded with the social unrest around racism and social inequity as these pandemics really impacted the same communities. Additionally, substance use disorder and the opioid epidemic did not go away when COVID started hitting our communities. Jerry Ali, you highlighted that in many cases, the same communities that have been hit so hard by the opioid epidemic have also been hit incredibly hard by COVID. And the dual impacts of these issues are a challenge that our providers are struggling to meet every day. One of the things that I think has been a positive that's come out of this is that we know that more people are reaching out for help. So we've heard from our providers, over three quarters of them have seen an increase in demand for their services. So we know that our communities are aware that we are there and that they're reaching out for help. However, as has been highlighted today, there are gaps in access that limit our ability to provide services. Um, 
particularly, you know, some workforce challenges, and then of course the, the social distancing. Our providers worked incredibly quickly, and I want to thank um, both the state and city um, regulatory bodies for providing the flexibility to allow our providers to transition to telehealth. They did that very quickly, and they really worked with their clients um, to not have the, the digital divide be a barrier. We had um, providers who were going to folks' homes, providing them with phones, providing them with tablets, signing them up for data plans, um, and in many cases, paying for that from the providers because it has not been consistently reimbursed by government. Um, and we had providers who continued to work in person and maintained um, programs open for clients who needed to access that. And I would also emphasize telehealth has been very successful for many of our clients. We've seen show rates higher than we had before. And we've seen that in populations that we might not have anticipated. So for example, our providers who work with just as impacted individuals have reported a real increase in show rates among that population, um, despite the fact that that is a population that tends to be quite marginalized. And so I think it shows how telehealth is a good modality for some individuals. I do want to say quickly on Intro 2005, we strongly support the intentions of this legislation. We are concerned that this could put a substantial reporting requirement on the behavioral health providers so that the city would have this data um, in a way that would not be feasible for providers at this moment in time when they are working so hard just to provide their core services every day. Um, and so we would like to work with you to identify what might be ways to get at this data that would uh, not be burdensome to the providers. Thank you for the opportunity to testify. Thank you, Nadia, that was a really good point. I will make sure to raise it um, uh, to Councilmember Lewis as well. Thank you very much to this panel. Our next panel will be Gary Stand Stankuski, Abraham Gross, and Neil Pesson. As before, uh, when you hear your name called, please wait for the Sergeant to cue you after you're unmuted. Gary, you can begin as soon as the Sergeant cues you. Thank you very much. Time begins now. All right. Uh, good afternoon. Thank you, Chair Ayala and the Council for the opportunity to provide testimony. I'm Gary Stankowski, the Chief Operating Officer at NADAP. Uh, I'm going to address some general client and provider experiences during COVID and also substance abuse screening for public assistance applicants. NADAP is a nonprofit based in New York City operating for 49 years. We are a multi-service organization providing substance use assessment services, case management, care coordination, and health insurance enrollment into the New York State marketplace. COVID-19 has had a devastating and long-lasting impact on New York City residents, particularly individuals with multiple or complex medical conditions, mental health diagnoses, and substance use disorders. Many individuals have few resources and less ability to navigate the changing service delivery system that now includes virtual services and telemedicine. Many also lack the resources to obtain needed care because of an inability to access Wi-Fi, the internet and computer hardware for virtual and telemedicine visits. As the COVID pandemic moves into the eighth month, the effect on vulnerable New Yorkers continues. Overall, individuals are less likely to seek treatment for medical, mental health, and substance use disorders on their own due to health concerns about exposure to COVID-19. Regarding screening public assistance applicants for substance use disorders, in response to federal and state welfare reform legislation, local social service districts are required to screen cash assistance applicants for substance use disorders. The New York City Human Resources Administration conducts a substance use screening questionnaire at job centers throughout the city. When a positive response is obtained, the cash assistance applicant is referred to HRA Substance Use Centralized Assessment Program for a substance use assessment conducted by a credentialed alcoholism and substance abuse counselor. NADAP is the vendor operating SUCAP, the, SACAP, uh, the assessment program. Before COVID, approximately 400 individuals were referred weekly for assessments with about 75% coming from job centers and 25% from residential treatment programs. During COVID, that number dropped to about 170 per week. In the beginning of August, that number dropped to approximately 55 per week, a decline of more than 
with almost all referrals coming only from residential treatment programs. This situation is counterintuitive because both substance use and the number of cash assistance applicants are increasing during COVID. Commissioner Banks has stated that the number of applicants is the highest in the city since 1967. As a result of these two factors, the number of cash assistance applicants being referred for assessments should be increasing instead of decreasing. Substance use screenings at job centers need to identify individuals using drugs and alcohol and resume referring them for substance assessments so they can receive treatment when necessary. As a result of applicants not being identified at the point of applying for cash assistance, thousands of people are not being referred to treatment. Thank you. Thank you very much. The next panelist is Abraham Gross. As soon as you're queued, you can begin. Thank you. Time begins now. Thank you, Chair Yala, Council Members Lois, Apri Samuel, and any other public official of integrity for this opportunity. I submit this testimony for the record on behalf of myself and many other New Yorkers whose mental health have suffered from this travesty. This travesty continues to harm the public beyond the suffering and the challenges for one's mental health that come is the challenge or the realization that public officials who have the resources and the mandate to help their constituents continue to show indifference to unnecessary suffering. To date, my pleadings before elected officials have amounted in the best case scenario to a promise for email follow-up, which led to a generic correspondence and unanswered emails. In the West, worst case scenario, public officials have transitioned from promising to help to receiving luxury, affordable housing, in the exact complex from which I was rejected. Today, September 22nd, is the one year anniversary of me being forced into public shelter for the first time in my life. Before this happened, I begged public officials and public agencies whose mandate it is to help the homeless population not to allow this to happen. I pointed out that there were hundreds of vacant apartments for which I was eligible. None of this made a difference. It is apparent that those decision makers have also not spent a day in their life in public shelter. There is nothing more harmful and destructive to a human being's mental health than being forced into a shelter. Well, in fact, that is not true. The only thing that is more destructive and harmful is facing those challenges during the break of the pandemic which I have been facing despite hundreds of apartments for which I am eligible, vacant, despite the admission that many of the luxury affordable apartments are going to ineligible applicants. As I speak these words, I know that many council members are aware of the problem with affordable housing. Many council members know that it is an unspeakable horror that human beings should suffer from homelessness during a pandemic. I'm inspired. Just gonna finish this point, please. While hundreds of apartments are vacant. This is so destructive to a person's mental health to see that public officials who can help and should help won't help. Chair Ayala, I am pleading with you, please at least reach out, call me and do what I humbly suggest is humanly warranted. Thank you for your consideration. Thank you, Abraham. Thank you very much. Our next panelist will be Neil Pessin. As soon as you're unmuted and the Sergeant cues you, you can begin your testimony. Thank you. You may begin. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chairman Ayala. 
uh, and members of the Committee on Mental Health and Disabilities and Addictions. My name is Neil Pesson. I'm the Vice President of the Community Mental Health Services at the Visiting Nurse Service of New York. And I appreciate the opportunity to testify about DNSNY CMHS experiences through COVID and the importance of pre preventing cuts to the behavioral health programs. DNSNY is the largest not-for-profit freestanding home community-based healthcare organization in the United States. And we are rooted, rooted in, the, in our commitment to New Yorkers and those most vulnerable among us. With critical support from the New York City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene, DOHMH, and the New York City Council, as well as uh, OMH, CMHS provides home and community-based behavioral services and case management services to vulnerable adults and children in, in every borough. Last year, we provided over 120,000 visits to over 16,000 residents. We offer a variety of services. Our mobile crisis team serves as a safety net for individuals in need of assessment and linkage due to psychiatric crisis. Our ACT programs, a service community treatment programs, provide multidisciplinary 24 hour, seven day a week community based treatment and support to people with severe mental illness, many of whom are homeless, suffer from substance misuse, and or are involved with criminal justice system. Our home based crisis intervention program offers an alternative uh, to out of home placement for youth experiencing psychiatric distress. And our geriatric programs have the goal of helping the older adults remain at home and out of institutional care. Uh, some of our geriatric programs are supported by the city council. About 67% of the adults and 90% of the children we serve are racial or ethnic minorities, with the majority of them living in neighborhoods hit highest by COVID. Almost all are insured or qualify for Medicaid. Since the beginning of the COVID emergency, we have provided critical behavioral health interventions to nearly 7,500 New York City residents never has the need for mental health intervention has been so important to prevent isolation, escalation, and institutionalization. Those we serve have a higher incidence of trauma, anxiety, and depression, as well as a need for assistance in accessing benefits and necessity, uh, necessities such as housing, food, and medication. We have found that children that the children referred during COVID have exhibited increased depression, isolation, disconnection from therapeutic services, and dissolving of family cohesion. For adults referred during COVID, as well as in our geriatric program, we have seen an increase in the report of suicidal ideation, social isolation, paranoid beliefs, depression, agitated behavior, substance use, and alcohol misuse, as well as seeing continuous stream of referrals who become disconnected from their treatment. The, it is vitally important that we continue our, to support the proven mental health expired. Um, and, and prevent uh, further cuts in our programs. Thank you, Neil. Thank you so much. Thank you very much to this panel. Our next and final panel will include Will Robertson and Melissa Moore. If you were hoping to testify and we've inadvertently left you out, please use the Zoom raise hand function so that we can ensure to have you on the next panel. In the meantime, for Will and Melissa, when you hear your name called, please wait to be unmuted and for the sergeant to cue you and then you can begin. Will Robertson, as soon as you're ready, you can begin. Thank you. You may begin. He's on mute. You can begin, Will. Will, can you hear us? Okay, we appear to be having some technical issues with Will. We can return to him uh, as soon as he gets his sound back. In the meantime, Melissa Moore, you can begin as soon as you're unmuted and the sergeants cue you. Melissa, when you're ready, thank you. You may begin. Good afternoon and thank you, Chair Ayala and the committee for the opportunity to speak at today's much needed hearing. I'm Melissa Moore, the New York State Director at Drug Policy Alliance, which advances evidence-based drug policy that's grounded in science, compassion, health, and human rights. Um, and our work is aimed at reducing harms both from drug prohibition and drug use. We're deeply concerned about our community members who are most vulnerable during the COVID-19 crisis, 
including people of color, people in jails, prisons, and immigrant detention centers, people otherwise enmeshed in the criminal legal system, people without housing, and those who use drugs who are accessing treatment or are in recovery. We know that racism, stigma, discrimination, and inadequate social safety net, including barriers to healthcare, were impacting these communities long before COVID-19, but are amplified and compounded amid the current pandemic. People who use drugs are facing even more challenges to accessing life-saving harm reduction services and medications for treatment than before. The racialized punishment of people who use drugs has not stopped, and additional policing, surveillance, and criminalization is already on display. I'm including DPA's full COVID-19 policy recommendations with my testimony for your reference as well. But with regard to overdose, I wanna highlight that New York was already experiencing an overdose crisis before the COVID-19 crisis hit, and we were losing a New Yorker every six hours to a preventable overdose death. COVID-19 has made the ongoing crisis in New York even worse, putting people who use drugs and harm reduction services in jeopardy and the financial stress and housing insecurity impacting many New Yorkers, as many have talked about today, plus disruptions and contaminations in the drug supply and people using alone have increased the danger for fatal overdose. Unless we act, life-saving services will be harder to access and overdose deaths will continue to skyrocket. We know that people are being arrested and criminalized for possessing, possessing syringes and medication for opioid dependency. This is because New York has a draconian law that puts people at risk of being arrested for simply possessing syringes and also limits the number of syringes people can purchase at a pharmacy. This undermines public health and can lead to people sharing or reusing syringes, which can contribute to contracting diseases like HIV and hepatitis C. Um, and people also face huge challenges in accessing medication-assisted treatment like buprenorphine, uh, which we know is one of the most effective treatments for opioid dependency. And they can even be arrested and criminalized for possessing it. Whereas jurisdictions like Philadelphia and Burlington, Vermont have decriminalized buprenorphine and recognized that it's a public health intervention, we haven't done that. But I really wanna to focus today at the nexus of mental health and drug use um, and note that this Friday is the eighth anniversary of when Mohammed Ba was killed by the NYPD after his mother called 911 for an ambulance. And last Friday, we revisited the death of Dwayne Pritchett at the hands of the NYPD following his father's 911 call for help when he was in a mental health crisis. And the Attorney General's office determined not to charge the officers who killed him because of findings of drug use. It's horrific that family members' calls for help during a mental health crisis have resulted in the NYPD killing their loved ones. We can't um, stand right. silent. We cannot stand silent in case after case where there is no accountability for law enforcement killing people in the midst of a mental health crisis and then the person's drug use is being used as a justification for their death. Let's be very clear, the drug war that diverted valuable resources away from community health and towards militarized policing killed Dwayne Pritchett and far too many other New Yorkers. New York must stop operating in a way that prioritizes and values criminalization and demonization over health responses that center a person's well being when they're in crisis. And we need city leaders to make it abundantly clear that, res that responses to mental health and substance use should have nothing to do with police. It's beyond time to ensure that New York shifts our approach to mental health response away from police and instead reallocates those resources to city and health agencies, harm reduction programs, and community based organizations, all of whom are better trained and equipped to address acute crises and actually keep our communities safe. I welcome any questions you might have about the syringe criminalization or medication assisted treatment access or other overdose issues. Um, and thank you very much for having this hearing. This is certainly the moment to scale up harm reduction strategies that have been proven to be effective in fighting overdose and certainly not the time to criminalize such efforts. Thank you very much. Thank you, Melissa. I, I really appreciate that testimony. Um, I'm, I'm living all of that in real life for, um, as we speak and um, I, I understand where you're coming from. Um, I appreciate you all coming to testify and look forward to following up with a few of you um, afterwards. Are there any others? Did we rectify the Will Robertson call? Uh, we're gonna attempt to go back to Will now. We'll, we'll give him a moment. He was good and then he got muted again. Will, just un try to unmute. Well, he's on the phone, so somebody's gonna have to unmute him. Hello, can you hear? Uh, can you hear me? Yes. We hear you. We hear you. you may okay, be thank you. All right, all right. Um, first of all, my name is Will Robinson. Um, a community leader for Vocal New York. I'm also a recovery coach at Harlem United. A member of the Peer Network of New York, 
and also part, I also work with the Bronx um, Collective. Anyway, um, what I really want to talk about, I want to talk about something a little different from what everybody's talking about. I'm, I'm the type of person, I'm on the ground. Um, during COVID, when COVID started, when everything shut down, everything just shut down immediately. We, we didn't have a chance to give our participants any warning or, you know, that, you know, we're not coming back out there to give you all some riches. We're not coming back out there to give you an lock zones or anything like that. So um, what we decided to do at the Pair Network of New York, we were back out there in two weeks. During that two weeks, we had to run around to try to get people to donate masks, ran around acting for donations for uh, PPE gear. In other words, so we could be protected because we didn't want to leave our participants out there like that. Uh, when we got out there, <laughs> the participants were so happy to see us. They were telling us they were using dirty needles. They were telling us they were using needles with blood in it and they're rinsing it out with the water from the fire hydrant, you know? Um, and just to leave them out there just like that, we couldn't see it. So the pair network was out there within two weeks at, uh, from the pandemic. We all went out there working without pay, just to serve to our community. Um, okay, as as things as things start getting better, as we started serving them with the syringes, then we started picking up syringes. Okay, come to find out, on an average time, on an average day, for three hours, we pick up anywhere between eight hundred to twelve hundred syringes a day. Um, um, council person. Uh, Ayala, we work in your community and we do see the public usage. Um, but I have to admit one thing, the participants got so trusted and comfortable with us that they're talking to us like, um, we're talking to them just like they're people, you know what I'm saying? They are people, you know? But what I say people is just that, you know, I'm able to talk to them and tell them, stop throwing the syringes around. All right, we put them in one place so when we come there, we could pick them up. You know, it's not uh, y'all disrespecting the neighbor, but so some respect for yourself, you know, and that's it. That we're able to talk to them like that. Um, we ask them what's going on, what do they need out there, what they're missing. Some of the simple things are garbage cans, garbage bags. Um, some other the fishing tips are talking about what they need, some place to go to the bathroom. Because if you notice it, especially in that area of the Bronx, there's an increase of human feces all through the streets because they have nowhere to go to the bathroom. Because what this pandemic did was they can't run to a restaurant. They can't run to the store to go to the bathroom. You know, um, a lot of times we talked to the participants. Like this, yesterday alone, I talked to three participants, pulled me over and said, can I talk to you? You know, they're getting tired of coming out to, you know, doing what they're doing, you know. But we established some type of relationship with them, you know. You got to remember, these participants out there, a lot of people look at them, they look at them with the stigma that they're nobody, but they're somebody. They're somebody's mother, daughter, sons, fathers, and they're out there, they're human beings, you know. Um, and another thing that we really got to start to do, we got to get prepared for the second wave. There's, there should have been a problem for us to bust our butts looking for masks, looking for this, looking for that, okay? We learned from the first wave. There might be a second wave, and we talk about within a month or so. So we have to be prepared for that. You know, all these cuts and stuff like that, that's not going to help us. That's not going to help us. And we also, what we really have to do is remember that um, harm, reduction is, harm reduction is not just giving out syringes. It's not just giving out. Uh, picking up needles, harm reduction, any positive change. And I've seen a lot of positive change in some of the participants we've given out there. But like I said, we can't force them to do what they do, but we're there for them when they're ready. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Will. Thank you. Um, I, I appreciate that because I, I know specifically talking about the second wave, um, there are a lot of concerns that individuals that are using together are not necessarily, um, you know, don't have access or not using um, PPE while they're, you know, in, in these uh, small quarters um, together. And so that's something that's that's really concerning to us as well. Um, so thank you. Thank you for your testimony. And thank you all for coming today. Um, unless there is anyone that we have missed. At this time, we have no others who are hoping to testify. And just a reminder to all our panelists that they can submit written testimony as well. 
Uh, Chair Ayala, you can now close the hearing. Um, we will now be adjourning this meeting. Thank you so much for everyone that came. Thank you.